Uh, good morning, everybody. Glad that you guys are here today. Happy Father's Day to everybody in the room. We're so glad that you spent uh, Father's Day here with us at Hope City Church. Today, men, we want to celebrate you. I promise we're not here to beat you up or make you feel guilty about being a dad or uh, any of those things. We just want to honor you and celebrate you because we believe that one of the greatest callings that is you can have uh, as a man is when your children are following in your, your footsteps. And, and not only just your children, but those, those people around you, because every single person in here, whether you have biological children or you have adopted children or you've got children that just kind of look to you like a spiritual father, uh, we, we just praise God for the influence that you have in their life. I watch as kids run into Hope City Church, and as they, they greet other, other men and other, other people, other people here at Hope City, and I recognize that every single one of you is pouring into this next generation, and we, bought, we pause and, and honor you. Today, I, I watched uh, in our all-team huddle with our dream team, I watched as a, a little toddler came running over to uh, another man that's not his dad and just hugged his leg, and, and it was like there was this connection there that this little kid knows that, that this man has been there and will be there and continues to show up in his life. And so thank you, thank you, thank you for being men who step up and step in. Dads, your job is mission critical. Like it is mission critical. And we recognize you today. We honor you today. We celebrate you. And so I hope that today you just kind of pause for a little bit on your way out because we want to we wanna honor you and celebrate with you and have a little bit of fun there on the patio after service today. So happy Father's Day, everybody. Uh, and we are kicking off a new series today that fits into this theme. We, I mean, what, what better theme is there than, uh, you know, wolves howling at the moon, right, for Father's Day? It just doesn't, it doesn't get any better than that. 80s wolf, nonetheless. The only way this could get better is if we just had like a pair of, you know, Air Monarchs or some New Balance up here. Then we could really start talking about Father's Day. Uh, But today, this series, Endangered Species, is uh, one that I've been really excited about because I've been noticing, as well as you, I'm sure of this, that there are things in our world around us that are beginning to be on the decline or on the decrease. We've got a culture and a world that's pressing in on us that hinders us from growing inside, um, and it's eliminating certain characteristics and traits. You know, more and more, there are things inside of us that would qualify to be on the endangered species list. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to be uh, jumping into certain character traits, certain virtues that are harder and harder to find. And, and this week I looked up, what are some of the animals that are still on the endangered species list? And you're probably not going to be surprised with some of these, but, but maybe you'll be surprised with the number of these. So the first one that is on the top of the endangered species list is this, is the rhino right over here. There, it's estimated there's 67 Six, seven, only 67 of these rhinos left in the world in, in, uh, that are not in captivity. Then the leopard follows up behind that. This is the Amor leopard. It's only uh, 19 to 26 of these left in the world in the wild. Now, this guy over here, compared to these two, he's doing real well. Because the Sunda tiger, there's only 3,900 left of them in the world. And, and this can reveal a very stark reality. The stark reality is that if something isn't done, these species will go extinct. They will no longer exist on this planet. And collectively, you and I were witnessing a shift in our culture that is watching certain character traits line up with with endangered species. Character traits like integrity, humility, and the ability to sit in silence and solitude. You know, it wasn't that long ago that I was explaining to my kids in a car ride. I was like, do you know what I used to do in a car ride? Be bored, right? Like, I would just sit there. <laughs> like, you know what? That is that is one of the most endangered. Uh, actually, that's extinct. Boredom is extinct. No kid is bored anymore. It's like they got a million things at their thumbs, and so do you, right? Like, humility, though. Humility is one of the least valued virtues in our world because our climate has increasingly changed. We value performance over substance. We've reduced everything into short-form reels and and microwave snippets. About 12 years ago, a book came out by the name of Platform. You can see it right here on the screen. Uh, It's written by a a guy by the name of Michael Hyatt. Um, Not calling Michael Hyatt out on this, but I'm calling myself out. I got this book, and I was like, 
I need to devour this book right now. Because 12 years ago, Instagram was on the rise, Facebook was on the rise, Twitter was, uh, was a thing, and um, you know, there's just all kinds of attention in the world. And this book was centered around how to get noticed in a noisy world. And I thought, man, I need to be noticed. I've got something to say. I want somebody to hear it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just devour this book. And the funny thing about this book is that there's two things. One is that uh, there is a very noisy world out there. The world is filled with noise. And the second thing is that there is a lot of people that want to be noticed. I was one of them. But you know what? A whole lot hasn't really changed in 12 years. Because remember when the, uh, the blue check came out in Instagram and Twitter? And that, like the, the blue check, for those of you that uh, maybe haven't had a cell phone in your life, uh, a blue check is, is essentially when some company determines that you're a real person. And they're like, this person is of influence, so we need to verify that this is who they are. And I was like, man, if I could just get verified, that would be so cool. People would actually listen to what I have to say, and, and like, they, they would be retweeting me and, and all this stuff. And, and then I get to the end of that, and you're like, wait a second, what? A very noisy world, and again, I'm looking to be noticed. This is kind of the opposite of, of humility, See, the, rea- the reality is that too many of us, we want a platform before we have the character to maintain it. We might have the personality to attract it, but we don't have the character to sustain it. See, character is grown over time and, and through pressure, under pressure. Character develops in you over a length of time and through the pressure that pushes down on you. And our character is critical. And if we're not guarding and growing our character, we will watch the endangered species list grow. And here's what we know. We know that pride is built on a lie. It's the perception that it's, it's what you're presenting as reality. Like this thing of, I need to show off, I need to show others. Like, you know, if you click open social media, it is filled with, look at me, look at me. Like, look at the perception of, of my reality is what I'm presenting. That's, that's what it is. Compare yourself to me. Or you, you've, been, you've interacted with pride too when you have conversations with people that are always one-upping you, right? You're like, well, I went to the beach the other day. Oh, I own the beach. I, I, I got a, a suntan. I am tan. I am the suntan, right? Like you're like, what? What are, what are you even saying? Or I, I had a really pretty good steak. I make the best steak. And you're like, whoa, okay, all right. And then all of a sudden you kind of walk away from that. Like, I don't really know that I want to be a part of this anymore. Or, or have you ever seen those people that, that show up and they're like, I don't do that. You're like, I, I clean, I'm going to clean up here real quick. Oh, I don't, I don't do that. Uh, that's, that's below me. Like, I, I am a, I'm above that, right? Like, I don't wait on others. I could never be a waitress or a waiter. That's just below me. That's beneath me. See, it's possible. It's possible to find yourself on the endangered species list without even really being aware of it. In 1979, uh, in that, it's actually 74, the a gray wolf was placed on the endangered species list. And and it was because in the United States of America, there was less than 600 of these wolves in, in their natural habitat. They were on the decline, rapidly declining. And somebody had the foresight to recognize that there were less and less of these wolves out there. And so what they did was they, they hit pause. And they said, we need to do something about this. And they got intentional with what they were doing. And over the course of the next you know, 30, 40 years, the endangered species list, they were removed from it. And right now, today, there's over 6,000 gray wolves in, in, uh, you know, in the wild with that population growing rapidly. And here's how, it, here's how it began. It started by facing the facts. And the facts are that there are virtues and character traits that are just increasingly hard to find in you and me. But the good news is that we can turn that story around. That there is tons of opportunities for you and for me to turn this around. I understand that humility is one of the least valued virtues in, in our society. It really is. And yet, the Bible tells us that it is one of the, uh, the attributes of the truly great according to Scripture. 
So today I wanna invite you to turn in your Bibles. There's Bibles on the chairs around you. You can open up your YouVersion app on your phone or jump into the Hope City app and we'll have the, the scripture there for you. But jump into Philippians chapter two today. Philippians two is perhaps the New Testament's most profound statements on what made Jesus Christ truly great. Like if you're looking at the greatness of Jesus, you know, you think about some of the, the professional athletes that are the greatest of the great, and you say, oh man, that guy, he had this incredible shot, or they were a defensive monster, or you know, all these kinds of things. Well, what made Jesus truly great? You know, what proved that he just wasn't godly, but he was God incarnate, God in the flesh? What did the apostle Paul highlight? Was it his omnipotence, the fact that he was all-powerful? Or was it his om, uh, omniscience that he was all-knowing? Was it his miracles, the ways that he touched lives and that they were changed or healed? Paul says, actually, none of the above. See, Philippians highlights a single attribute, and it's Jesus' humility. Let's read these verses together in chapter 2. It says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. And he goes, he says right here, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but let's, let's say this word together, in humility. In humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should not look to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Paul raises the flag and he says, if you're united with Christ, like if you would call yourself a Christian, if you say that you follow Jesus, if you're united with Christ, if you take any comfort from his love or his being connected with God, then what is it that we need to get out of this? He says, let humility show up in your life. Paul says, if you don't believe me about humility, let's just take a look at Jesus. Here's what Jesus did, right? He says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is God's word. This is Paul's humility handbook for us. Of all the attributes that Paul could have talked about, about Jesus, he chose humility. He looked at that and said, there is something that you need to know here. His holiness, it's, it's like woven in with his humility, his compassion, his love, his wisdom, his grace. But the defining characteristic, scripture says that was essential, that made the highlight real for Jesus was humility, this one word, humility. In fact, that Jesus Christ, even though he was God, he voluntarily humbled himself, coming to earth, invested his life serving other people, just like you and me, so that we could live. He died a criminal's death in our place on the cross for our sins so that we might receive forgiveness when we trust in his name. But Jesus, the king of heaven, chose humility and lived here on earth. Jesus, the creator of all things, became just like his creation. Jesus, even though he was the creator and ruler, he held no position and accumulated no wealth. That is humility. Even though you and I were created to worship him, he came here to serve us. Like, just think about that. He came to serve you and me. If we're going to define humility, uh, one of the ways that I've been thinking about humility this week is that humility is a modest self-perception in action. It's a modest self-perception. It's not too much, and it's, 
It's not nothing. It's just a modest self-perception put into action in your life and mine. If you want to kind of make it even easier to think about, uh, humility is freedom from pride. If you're going to cultivate the kind of Christ-like uh, character that gets God's attention, this is, this is serious. You and I, we need to understand that the endangered virtues in your own life, that if you don't cultivate that humility, we're going to miss out on one of the greatest things that God sees in his people. But did you notice where Paul started? Paul started with this. He, he pointed out to Jesus, uh, to Jesus and he said, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. He didn't say, he didn't flex on anything else. He just said, your attitude should be like Christ. It's no, it's no coincidence that Paul starts with attitude because very often attitude is the first thing that greets you when you encounter other people. You show up to work and you're like, oh boy, it's gonna be one of those days. Why? Because you can tell your boss has that attitude or your coworker has that attitude and you're like, oh man, I just don't even know how I'm gonna make it through the day. You, can, you wake up and your kids greet you with attitude and you're like, ah, oh, man, this is gonna be a long day. I came across somebody who was filled with self-confidence and had no problem flexing on his dad. In fact, he might have a little bit of an attitude, so check out this video right here. And then he can fight that much. He has tiny muscles. Does he? Look at these whoppers. <laughs> nearly, nearly a size of a mountain. <laughs> Ain't they, Bobby? Huge. Build them! Build them! <laughs> Oh my god, they're big mountains. What about your daddy? He hasn't got any, does he know? No, they're tiny. They're nearly up to here. Does he need to do? He needs to work out. I go to the gym every day. Do you? Yeah. And how do you get to the gym? My daddy drives me. <laughs> All right. I wake him up. Then he drives me over there. Then I lift the weights. I'm gonna go to the gym tomorrow while you wake up. <laughs> See, the funny thing is that we can laugh about little Jacob right now, but we're disgusted by adult Jacob. Like, it's funny when he's like, feel them, feel them, mommy, right? Like, you're like, oh, whoa, okay. But if I was to stand up here and I was like, get out, I work out every day, you'd be like, dude, like, enough. Like, you are so full of yourself and you're a liar. <laughs> this is where we would see ourselves. But, like, our attitude, our attitude is so important. It's cute in a little kid, it's disgusting in adults. Like, and if we don't pay attention to this, we're going to grow in ways that we're not proud of. See, this is, this is what happens. Paul gets right after our attitude because he says, humility starts in your heart, but it shows up in your actions. It's, it's the way that you live your life. See, when you choose to fix your attitude, it aligns your actions. So the question for you today literally is, what is your attitude like? You know, I hate to press on that, but where is your attitude? Because this changes the way that you parent. If your attitude is in line with humility, then your kids are not a nuisance. Your kids are not a frustration. They are an opportunity. They are a gift. It's a, it's a privilege to be able to serve and to mold and to shape and to correct and to discipline and to correct and to discipline again and to stay engaged and to keep pressing. It's not a nuisance. They become your mission. They become what God has entrusted you with in their care as your mom and as their dad. Humility, it, it's, it's taught and caught. In fact, I would argue that as parents, humility is one of those things that they're going to see in you before they ever hear from you. That they're going to see you being humble. They're going to see you living a life that is, that is filled with humility before you even start talking about humility. And if humility is a modest self-perception in action, then pride, we need to define that too. Pride is a constant self-preoccupation. It's just thinking about me all the time. And in years gone by, our culture pushed very much against pride. In fact, you know, we would think about, you know, what is it that we can do for our country? 
we would say things like, don't get too big for your britches or don't get a big head. And nowadays we're like, yo, fake it till you make it, right? Like, you know, go, go, go live and, and tell everybody what you're, you're thinking. Become an influencer when you don't even know what you're influencing. See, behind the attitude of humility is what theologians would call the Augustinian worldview. And in this view, it was that we held ourselves, within ourselves, uh, we need God to help master the weakness that is inside of you. And in the Augustinian worldview, the very worst trait is pride. Because pride sets itself up as the mother of all sins because it isolates you from God. Pride says, I am the God of my own life, and I don't need anybody else. But Paul says that humility starts with our attitude. And he further clarifies in verse 3 when he says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Now, most people think of humility, and they reject the idea of humility because it means that I can't, I don't have any ambition. I can't do anything. I don't have any drive. Like, I've just got to kind of go with the flow. That's not true. There's a difference between godly ambition and selfish ambition. Godly ambition strives to do the best in order to give God glory. The things that God has given you, the gifts, the talents, the abilities, to use those to point to God. It's, it's kind of looking Godward. But selfish ambition is saying, look at me. Everybody, just look how great I am. Did you see that? Did you pay attention to that? Right, like it's, it's Jacob saying, feel them, mommy, feel them. It's driving it all back to you. See, selfish ambition is different because it's, it's more of a horizontal approach. Whereas godly ambition is a vertical approach that whatever I do, it's to draw attention vertically rather than horizontally. In other words, it's not about me and how do I look better than others? Do they admire me? Do they even know that I'm here? Do they care? See, the Greek word for selfish ambition is actually a spirit of rivalry. That's, that's what that means, of competition, an intense desire to one-up my opponent. And yet, with humility, Paul tells us that humility gives God the credit. Humility, if you're going to be humble, you give God the credit. Because when it comes time to drop names, whose name do you drop? Is it yours or his? See, it starts with our attitude, and it shows up in our actions. When I was a um, campus pastor, I was in a team of about five other campus pastors, and I was, I was younger, quite young. I was young to be a campus pastor, but uh, they took a chance on me. They hired me, and uh, I stepped into this role, and, and I knew I wanted to make a name for myself in the organization, in the church, which sounds crazy, I know, but um, I stepped into a, a meeting one day, and for some reason, we got on the topic of arm wrestling. <laughs> And I looked at the oldest campus pastor in the room, and I challenged him to an arm wrestling match. Now, this, this guy's, first off, he's Canadian, and he's old. So I was like, for sure. Like, I got the strength of, of like, a bald eagle. I'm ready to go. Let's go, America. Like, I could take you out. And so I challenged him in front of everybody to an arm wrestling match. And this guy um, was just quiet. He was, um, you know, he was just a little bit like a, not a wallflower, but he was humble, Okay, humble man. And I'm kind of walking around, puffing out my chest in the office, and I'm, and I'm bringing people into the, the conference room, like, look at what's about to happen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm going to embarrass Pastor Kyler, right? And so I get, we get it going, and uh, I put my arm on the table, and as soon as my hand grips his hand, I realize that I'm, I am very much in trouble. He, <laughs> he had some very serious old man strength, and I was like, this is not going to go well. And sure enough, within three seconds, he had my arm, and I could tell that he was being so kind because it could have been pounded into the table in one second. I underestimated him, and what I actually was trying to do was draw all attention and get all credit for me. I was trying in my insecurity to get people around me to recognize me. Humility gives God the credit. It was, there wasn't one time... 
that Pastor Kyler told me, hey, by the way, I go to the gym every morning at 5 a.m. Like, I didn't know that till afterwards. I wouldn't have challenged him had I known that. And, and it was just, he was such a humble man. See, what I did was the opposite of Paul's instruction. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourself. What I was trying to do is actually show myself to be better than others. That's pride. And I got to confess that pride wells up in me at times. And I got to just stuff that back down to consider others better than me. I remember that story with, with Pastor Kyler. Because I need to be reminded of that. That it's not just about quiet strength and not knowing, did I not read it right? No, 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 it's about the attitude that was in my heart. Why did I ever need to challenge him to an arm wrestling match? Like, how stupid was that? How foolish. Like, the people in the room really should have been laughing at me. Like, why? Why would you do that? Where is that need? And that need was, was based out of immaturity. It was based out of the need to have people prop me up. Let a, like it was off from who God created me to be. Yes, I had strengths, I had abilities. I, I mean, but it's, re, it's, about, it's about God, not about me. Humility says, what can I do for others? How can I put others ahead of me? You know, a, a litmus test for this is, who do you think of most? Like when it comes time to it and you think about your attitude, who do you think of most? Or here's another one. Let's just get really practical because humility is practical. What do you do in the TSA line at the airport? Yeah, here you go. Uh, when you get into that cattle chute, right, that funnel, do you cut everybody off? Or do you say, no, no, go ahead. You go ahead. You go ahead, you can go in front of me. Do you need, do you need my bin? Right? This is, this is what happens. It's practical, it's real, and yet it's often unseen, and it's an endangered virtue. See, Jesus made it really, really practical too. In verse, in verse uh, uh, eight, he says, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and got practical, and he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus did not flex his divinity he sacrificed himself for you. He just said, no, 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 you are more important. He put himself in a position where it wasn't about what was gonna be enjoyable for him. There were no selfish motives in this. I promise you that. That the one who is intricately involved in the creation of the planets and everything that we see put you first. And in the ancient world, humility was not a, a prized virtue. It was a culture that actually operated on bringing honor to your family. So any thought of lowering yourself in the eyes of others was repulsive. Humility was stuff of slaves, not of respected rabbis. And here comes Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, that's divine, the creator. He had no need to prove himself. He didn't need to show that he was the most powerful person in the room. He didn't you know, think that, th that being... Um, God was something that he would just be grasped and show off. He did the unthinkable in that world. He made himself nothing. This is humility in action. Jesus took a life of downward mobility for you and for me, my life and for yours. See, from Jesus, we learn that humility chooses you over me. It's an action and an active decision to choose you over me. To say, you matter more than what I want. And Jesus had a simple formula for it. It's that you are greater than me. True humility not only knows that, but also applies it. It's determining that your needs are more important than my own right now. I have needs, but I'm voluntarily letting my status, foregoing my status, foregoing what I can flex, my resources, to serve other people before myself. And this is the logical outcome of biblical humility. Feels weird to say, but that's because humility is on the endangered species list. So let's get practical. Humility chooses you over me. 
but humility is not putting yourself down. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's just thinking of yourself less. It's not lowering your self-esteem, it's esteeming others more. You start to lift others up and focus on other people, and this is not normal in our world. But this is what the Bible talks about, where true greatness comes from. This is what the Bible talks about when it says, you should be like Christ. That's not just showing up to church, it's your attitude with other people. You can tell when people are humble when you get in conversations with them because they ask you questions about you. They're interested in how are you doing rather than just let me tell you all about me and, and what happened to me this week and, and how bad my life is and how, how exhausting that life is. And, you know, the conversation is it's about everybody else in the room. How can I breathe life into that other person? But what about me? Wait a second. Like, because I need to be taken care of too, Right? But even for just a second, if you're considering being humble, watch what God does with the humble. This is his math, his rules. Look at what Jesus, what happened with Jesus. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above every name. This comes directly after the verse, the passage of scripture that says Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to death on a cross. And then God lifted him up. God put him on display that every knee, every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. In other words, everybody's going to know his name because he stooped low and served other people. See, Philippians, it's starting a humility revolution. Honor and shame are flipped on their heads. And James 4.10 says, if you humble yourselves before the Lord, he will lift you up. See, the low point is now the high point. To be exalted, you need to stoop low. And this is God's invitation to you and to me. In humility, consider others better than yourselves. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Because when you go low, it gives God the opportunity to raise you up. But if you've already elevated yourself, there's nowhere where God can put you. You're already there. But just imagine, if you go low, how God can raise you even higher. Dads, you might be the head of your household. You might be the strongest in your family, but that doesn't mean that everyone serves you. Humility should lead you to serve them, to care for them, to protect and to provide for them. Humility is beautiful. It may be endangered, and it may not be you know, the most loving thing or the lovely thing in the world's eyes, but it is magnificent. This week, be on the lookout to celebrate humility in others. Because what gets celebrated gets repeated. But put this into practice in your own life. I know that it's unnatural and it requires supernatural strength, but it's something that the Spirit of God can put inside of you that we can see in our generation, we can see in our church. Let's just start, let's get practical right here, right now. We can move away from pride and move towards humility. We can make it less about me and what do I get out of this and, and does the church serve me? And how can I love and bless other people? So is there a place in your life right now that God is calling you to choose humility? You know, maybe it's a confrontation at work where you decide to actually back down, not out of fear of your boss, but you're just gonna trust the Father. Maybe there's a promotion that is coming your way, and if you take this promotion, it means time away from your family, and maybe you're gonna choose humility and, and trust that God's gonna elevate you at the right time. Maybe there's a relationship that needs mending in your world, and it would require you to humble yourself and apologize. Or maybe there's a mistake or a weakness you have that you just need to acknowledge in front of others. Could you do that this week? Let's turn this around. Let's let humility be one of the markers of us as, as men and women, as students that follow Jesus and trust that God will raise you up just the right time.